Uh, well, I won't go down all of these items, but this is what we're going to discuss today, and I wanted to make sure the slides were later on covered it. But for those of you who don't know me, uh, you know, I go by my initials CAM. Uh, I worked on the Apache Spam Assassin project for the last two decades, and I particularly love this picture because uh, it, basically I'm off-brand Canadian spam, apparently. So, all right. First disclaimer, you know, uh, I sit on a lot of boards, I do a lot of different work, and uh, this talk is not specifically about the ASF, though I'm here on behalf of the ASF where I work as an executive officer. So, all right. So first rule for being on a board member and being effective. So being on a board is a great way to improve your pay rate, great career move, and so part of the reason that I think people can really benefit from these tips that I've gained over, you know, 25 years, is start with a volunteer uh, board, and that will get you the experience you need, how to be an effective board member, uh, to work up to it in a career level, because that's really how you can take your career to the highest level. So tip number one, learn from other people's mistakes. One of my favorite books, and uh, it's actually been rediscovered recently, it's getting more press in uh, business colleges and whatnot, but it's The Dilbert Principle, written by Scott Adams, same guy who writes the comic strips. Uh, but basically what he's done is, in his, his, in his work in doing the comic strips, people would write him stories about how many dumb things occurred at their companies. And he took all of the knowledge and basically condensed it down along with his own experience and produced a business book about management principles. And I really highly recommend it. So, all right, business is like a marriage. So this is something I try and really uh, drive home for people who are on a board. You have to pick your board. You have to pick the people that are on it very carefully. Uh, pick your partners carefully on the board. Um, don't pick multiple partners for a marriage. That will definitely not, uh, not work. But uh, the thing that I often say is that if 50% of marriages fail, you can imagine how many businesses fail and how many boards fail to be effective. It, it's quite a bit higher. So set things up for the fact that you need tiebreakers. You need people who are good at debate and good at discussion so that it doesn't become you know, an onerous, bad task. One of my favorite things for meetings, uh, I will not attend in a meeting without an agenda. It, it's a great tip. Now, you can write an agenda for me that literally says, this meeting has no agenda. You know, that is acceptable to me. But by having an agenda, you really can streamline the meeting, people know what to expect, people show up prepared for the meeting, and, you know, part of that preparation is when the meeting is going to occur. And, one of the biggest tips that I give for nonprofits and for corporations alike is don't try and meet everybody's schedule. If you try and go through your calendars and say, oh, I can meet at Monday at noon. Oh, that doesn't work for me. Tuesday at nine, how's that? It, it doesn't work. Just pick something often, you know, noon on every third Wednesday of the, of the month. Things like that, set times, it will work its way out. People will be able to set, ahead, uh, set aside the time and it works on a long-term basis. And when you do that, keep and review the minutes from the last meeting, but minutes are really important to who made a decision, who was attending. It doesn't have to be really onerous, but it really helps, especially uh, with some of the things that we're gonna talk about, which are things like passing the baton and getting other people in there so that they can figure out who made the decision, who, oh, who ran that conference three years ago? Oh, I know who to go talk to and ask them a question about it. The little things in there can really pay off later on and it also gives you an opportunity to record action items, who's taking care of stuff, so it's in there. So people, before the next meeting, because you've got an agenda and you've got a set time, they can look at it and go, oh crap, I forgot, I'm supposed to take care of that issue that I didn't do, and they can get it done. They can get, it's basically the homework assignments. Next, mailing lists, you know, using mailing lists correctly. So at the ASF, you know, we talk about the fact that we're, we're a meritocracy. Some people, tongue in cheek, call us a mailocracy. Uh, talking both about the male domination in the IT field, but also about the fact that we want to do everything on a mailing list. They're great. They're really, really good for things like planning. They're great for records. I send all the after reports, et cetera. They're not always so great for discussions. Sometimes you get asked the same question 72 times. It becomes very, very frustrating when that happens. Um, but one of the biggest things that uh, I like to bring up is the fact that Email as a medium, as a way to communicate, is very, very cold. And uh, there's a great, 
uh, article that came out in Wired, and I think this came out, yeah, 2006. Um, so what this article basically did is it went over a psychology report from a well-respected journal, and what it talks about is the fact that 50-50 chance of what was the tone of the person who wrote the email. So basically, you, you, you can roll dice, you know, it's a flip of the coin as to whether or not you know what that person's tone was when the email was written. Were they angry? Were they happy? Were they, you know, you're just guessing. So you can't really ever read into anybody's uh, tone. But the interesting thing about this study that it also had was that people thought, and I think it was 80, no, 90% of the time, 90% of the time people thought they knew the tone of the email but only 50% of the time they were right. So, really great article, take a look at it. All right, this one is one that unfortunately shows my age a little bit. Uh, this was a great uh, topic that was used a long time ago, back in like 1994, I think, was when it was first really kind of uh, shaped up, actually on Usenet, for anybody old enough to remember Usenet. Uh, this came out of the forums for uh, the dating forums, like rec.dating, I think is where it came from. But the, the acronym was, uh, you know, DNFTEC, you know, do not feed the energy creature. And so this is something you have to realize. There are people that feed off of other people's energy. And one of my favorite examples about this, he's a good friend and he's, he's learned he's not as much of a jerk as he was when he was younger. But imagine, if you will, he would log on to a religious board and just post something like, there is no God, and then log out and never log on ever again. Knowing that that just, that there's like 5,000 threads that started and responses that came out of his work. So be careful of that. Don't feed into people's energy. Think about when you're responding to something like that, you know, is it worth the battle? Is it worth what they're doing? Are they trying to achieve something or are they just feeding off energy? All right, streamline your meetings. So uh, the Apache Foundation is a really great example of how to streamline your meetings. We have uh, you know, set agendas, we have set dates and times. We've had the same date and time, I think for close to 20 years now. Uh, but on top of that, we have some great tooling that's built on top of revision controlling systems. Uh, it's called Whimsy, uh, and whimsy.apache.org is the project. It's one of our top-level projects. Uh, we're looking for other organizations that want to use it, but it's basically how we do all our reports, how our chair runs the meeting, and everything and anything. So at Apache, if you ask, how do I do X, Y, Z, a good amount of the time, the answer is go to Whimsy, and it's taken care of there. So. You know, it lets you use shared agendas. You don't have to use Wednesday to do that. Uh, but on top of that, you can keep shared notes and minutes. Uh, these techniques, and we'll talk about some of the other ways you can use it, uh, you can achieve this besides Whimsy, but you know, they're important tasks. All right, I'll take a little break for a moment. So I have some quizzes. How many people are old enough to remember uh, emoticons that predated emojis? Anybody? Okay. All right, Any, anybody want to guess what this one is? This is a cat. Right. This one, same cat after getting run over by a car. Okay. This one, this is me in a tie. So if you turn sideways, it's easier. So don't hurt your neck, cat. All right. So the next thing I really try and focus on, and this is something that sometimes surprises people that are joining a board a lot, is uh, general corporate oversight. And so some people don't know the concept of a corporate veil, but if you think about it, like why does a corporation exist? Why don't we, for example, just start doing business without bothering with this incorporation and all this other uh, process? Well, basically, the, the concept behind it is that you're creating an entity so that you're protected personally. So what the company does and what you do aren't necessarily the same thing. And that's called a corporate veil or a corporate umbrella. And so there's a link on this, and the slides will be up on the website. But it talks about how to protect yourself, how to not get, uh, you know, how to not pierce the corporate veil, how to not get yourself in trouble for something your company does. Uh, and there's some basic things on this. Uh, for example, uh, like Business 101, when you start a business, they'll tell you every time you sign a contract or you sign any piece of paper, it's signed with your, your signature, your name, and your title. And the title makes it so you're signing on behalf of the company. And that means you're signing on behalf of that entity that you've set up. It's a very important concept that people have to understand because that's when things like insurance mechanisms and things like directors and officers insurance uh, can protect you. If you sign it personally, you need personal insurance, not the corporate insurance. Uh, but on top of that, some of the things you can do in the U.S., for example, you can add what's called a, a director's and officer's rider. So if you're doing nonprofit work, you can add a rider to your home insurance quite often. 
uh, that will protect you uh, uh, on some of these cases uh, and if there's a lawsuit on things like that. Additionally, uh, something that catches a lot of people by surprise, especially in the current era, things like GDPR, they're very surprised to find out that uh, officer and director and employee information, especially highly compensated employees, is public information. So people don't always like that. They're very surprised to find out that, oh, they go search their name on the internet and up come some various tax documents for various countries. Um, so that catches some people by surprise. And finally, and this is something I'm very strong about, uh, COID, it just stands for Conflict of Interest Disclosure. You know, and recusals is when you basically don't vote on something. I don't always require that people recuse themselves from a vote, especially if they have gone to the extra trouble of a announcing their conflicts of interest. Everybody has conflicts of interest. It really comes down to how they're handled, whether they acknowledge they exist, and how they make sure that they aren't interfering with their decision. So, pretty good important stuff. All right, debate. So, one of my favorite quotes with being on a board is from Martin Luther King Jr., and it basically just says, agree to disagree without being disagreeable. You're not going to convince everybody. Everybody is different, and consensus really isn't uh, always possible. And so, at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to agree that you're not going to come to a consensus, and you move on. And the second part of that is really kind of pick your battles. If it's something silly, you know, try and keep some distance from the issue at, at hand. You know, if it's a silly minor issue, let the debate die down, go with the consensus, honor the will of the board and the other people who voted on it, and, and let it go. If it's something bigger that you feel strongly about, you know, use that as a time to battle. And if you do that, you'll have more you'll have more understanding from the board when all of a sudden you really start to fight something because they'll understand that, oh, you know, you don't normally make a big deal and you're making a big deal about this. Perhaps we should take a second and, and rethink what we've just decided on. All right. Transparency, uh, succession, and ink. So really these, these three tenants, they kind of go together. And the reason they do is that, especially on a nonprofit, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about volunteerism and burnout. But you need to plan for your, your, the succession. Who's going to pick up the baton after you? And there's a great uh, presentation from last year that's linked down in the bottom that was about passing the baton. But if you share everything, if you write stuff down, if you start before you even do a task by writing the policy or writing the SOP, uh, standard operating procedure, for how you're going to do that task, it makes the next person who does that task do it better. It also, you know, I find it helps me a lot. Uh, many years ago, I was lucky. I had a friend of mine who uh, you know, pointed out to me when I was forgetting some stuff, uh, a Chinese proverb, and it basically says that the faintest ink is better than the brightest memory. And you know, the, 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 the much simpler version is just write shit down. You won't forget it. It's right in front of you, and it helps. So month to month, you can make things happen. So uh, one of the tools that I use and I really like is Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets. It's a great way to do things like agendas and minutes and planning documents. If you have never used these tools, their power isn't necessarily their amazing organization and, and formatting things. Things like Microsoft Word are, are amazing for that. But the fact that multiple people can work on the document at the same exact time, you end up with having an agenda prepared beforehand, everybody can look at it. You do the minutes in real time during the meeting. Everybody can read them, see if there's errors, et cetera. And when you're done with the meeting, your minutes are done. There's no extra work for a secretary to go back and organize the minutes. Send them out with an email. Your meeting's done. You have your records. Everything's good. All right. Good chairs. This is probably one of the biggest things that I like to point out. Pick your chairs and think about how they do it. They need to be somebody who's organized. They need to be fairly strong because they need to, uh, they need to set discussion limits. And that can be both minimums and maximums. They need to try and encourage everybody to talk about a topic. They need to stop people from talking about a topic sometimes and you know, uh, get to a certain point where decisions can be made. And that's the strength of a good chair is to try and keep discussion going. But remember when we talked about conflicts of uh, interest disclosure, there's little things that chairs should do that aren't always done. For example, a chair, as a general rule, should not vote. Or if they do vote, they should vote last so that they are not, uh, in, they are not uh, influencing other people's vote unfairly. So uh, the other thing I like to make sure of the people, avoid parliamentarian tricks. At the ASF, uh, Robert's Rules of Orders is kind of a... Uh, a bad word, that's how a lot of organizations run, try and stay away from it. If you're using too much parliamentarian tricks or, you know, point of orders, 
it's probably not a very successful meeting. It's probably not going to be very fun. It gets kind of old after a while. All right. And then the rule by uh, consensus we already kind of talked about a little bit. Promote inclusion. So this is kind of my big topic for the last year. Um, after a fairly, uh, you know, unwelcome suggestion that women weren't, uh, you know, capable of working in IT because of biological differences, uh, we wanted to really uh, focus on the fact that at the, the ASF, we build on a concept called meritocracy. And you earn merit based on the fact that you know how to do something. And it doesn't have anything to do with age, sex, religion, country of origin, sexual preference, uh, you know, socioeconomic status, etc. And so, you know, that's one of the things we do really hard to promote is promoting inclusion. But on top of that, we promote diversity. And I saw this quote recently on, on LinkedIn, and it really struck home that, you know, if you're in a life raft and, uh, you know, do you want everybody in that life raft to have the exact same skills you do? And hopefully the answer is no, you don't. And, you know, I point out that, you know, when you watch shows like Survivor, where they put people on an island, it's usually like this mess of people having all these conflicts and everything like that. And, you know, I compare it to like if, you know, if they took the U.S. Marines and, and put them on Survivor, by day three, they'd probably have a still running and have built three buildings and, you know, et cetera, and have an airstrip going in by day five. So, yeah, the point is, is that they, they purposely look at skills and you look at something like Survivor, they purposely pick people with clashing uh, skill sets or clashing uh, ideologies, etc. But at the end of the day, many hands make light work. So try and get other people to help and promote people with skills other than what you have. So one of the jokes I like to bring up a lot is one of my weird skills that's on my resume that my son asked me to add to a conference a couple of weeks ago is I have worked as a professional livestock painter. Um, you know, at Virginia Tech, we got this idea that we'd go out and tip cows. It's not possible. So we instead got back a couple of weeks later and decided to paint cows. We started painting Virginia Tech logos on it, and a rival university to us is the University of Virginia, so we painted things such as UVA socks on the cows. One day we were getting chased off by the farmer there, and uh, he says, stop, stop, stop. And we're like, we're sorry we painted your cows. And he said, no, 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 I don't care about that. He's like, I want to hire you to paint more cows because we got like 100 bucks extra at auction for the cows you painted. So. Uh, and I, I threw this dotted thing in there for Rich, so that's a, an Apache helicopter. So eventually, if we're, we get big enough and we buy an Apache helicopter, I can be the one to paint the logo on it for him. So, all right, JFDI. So this is uh, an acronym uh, that some people might be familiar with, but basically, it's just fucking do it. If you're on a non uh, a nonprofit board, many times the biggest thing you can do is step up to do something. Uh, you know, especially at the ASF. We want people to step up. We want to give them room to explore and do what they're doing, hopefully with some mentorship and some guidance on how to do it, some limits. Uh, because one of the, the things I say is there's three kinds of people. There's people, with, there's people with ideas, there's people with ideas they want you to implement, and then there's people with ideas that they want to implement. And pretty much uh, the people with, that they want other people to implement, they suck. So if you have an idea, step up. One of the things I talk about it is, Ask for delegation. Ask for, I want to do this. I need a budget to do this. I want permission to do this. And on top of that, you know, ask to be the person who reports to the board. So now you've got delegation, you've got a task, you've got a budget, you can make something happen. All right, volunteer burnout. So I won't talk too much about this, but it is something to realize, especially in the volunteer world, especially at an open source conference like this. Volunteer burnout is a real thing, it happens. And there's ways to fix it. Think about things like consecutive term limits. Think about making sure you're sharing and delegating things. And probably the biggest thing that I tell people to do is admit when there's a problem early. If you're running something like a conference and you wait till three days before the conference to tell people that, hey, you were too ill to do something or just you couldn't get it done, there's nothing anybody else can do to help. If you asked it three months later, earlier, excuse me, and you say, look, I'm just, I'm having a lot of problems. I can't take care of this. I need help. The problems can be fixed, and we're all human. We all have problems, you know. So just step up and do that. Again, some more items there on that uh, link there below uh, as well. Some more ideas for that. My last topic for today really is uh, about communication. So, you know, especially with email, we talk about this a lot at the ASF. You know, when when people misunderstand what you're doing, we work around the world, and so, uh, you know, I said, you know, do what I say, not what I do. Um, you know, speak slowly. It lets people 
understand what's going on. It lets people who aren't English as a native speaker or your particular language understand things. And there's some ideas here about you know, uh, you know, taming the steamroller, how not to just talk over people and what's going on, and also just uh, you know, a wonderful site that an, uh, a German native sent me that just how they can find out things technically that are translated between German and English and understand them. You know, those idioms that, that we all unfortunately use that aren't understood internationally all the time. Which kind of leads to some of the other problems that I've learned over the years that, you know, for example, in, uh, in the US, if we use the term uh, table and item, uh, I, it took me many years to find out that that is 180 degrees from what people across the pond mean when they say table an item. So in the US, when we table an item, it basically means we've put it away, we're not going to deal with it this meeting, it's going to be tabled until later down the line. In Europe, and especially in England, when they say they table an item, it means they're going to put it on the table and they're going to vote at it today that it's important, it's on the table. So it's just an interesting thing. People don't know what that means, so you have to be careful on these type of you know, regional confusions. Um, additionally, a whip vote. The whip vote is a very, it's a, it, the, the term nowadays you might be familiar with is doodle vote. That's a, a way of kind of getting a, a, a rough consensus. What's going on? Like, hey, what, what might work for this? Where do we want to go to dinner? And everybody kind of says, oh, this works. And then you can kind of come up. A whip vote is an actual position in the, the US Senate where they go around and kind of get an idea of like, do we have enough votes to make something pass? Same kind of idea. Uh, an endowment. Uh, at the ASF, we were working on an endowment project, and uh, it was quite surprising to find out that two of our nine board members, you know, some of the smartest people in the world, had no idea what the term endowment meant. And if people here don't know what it means, it's basically when you, you get donated a specific amount of money and you don't spend that money, you only spend the interest earned on that money so that you can have a long-term investment for the, the sustainment of the organization. And then one of my favorite ones, really, that I think fit for this conference was, uh, you know, the famous quote with uh, John F. Kennedy, which is somewhat done, but he basically said something to the extent of, I am a jelly donut, uh, you know, with Ichbin Berliner, because in Berlin, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce that uh, correctly, you know, that's their name for their jelly donut is that uh, P-F-A-N-N word. But, you know, there can be even minor confusions, even inside your own country. You know, if, if you tried to order a Berliner in Berlin, I don't know what you're going to get, to be honest. Uh, you know, probably not that, which has a different name. So, anyway, thank you all. I hope uh, this has been helpful, and you know, uh, my contact information is there. Send me an email if you have questions. And uh, do we have time for any questions? I think we're probably out. Um, not really. Not really. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Very much.